and socially as far as a community. That has been, after all, like a, not only an old human question, but it's old, an old American question. The other day you were saying about Choi Gum Trunk Rinpoche and the founding of Naropa, and I was thinking about how coincidence played such a big part, coincidence and fate and unusual circumstances, and supposedly um, Peter Orlovsky and Allen Ginsberg were trying to flag a cab in New York, and uh, Choigum Trungpa Rinpoche was trying to flag a cab in New York, and uh, they were competing over the same cab. They Instead of fighting over the cab, they got into a conversation, and then he was like, are you Allen Ginsberg? And I don't know how the cab thing got resolved. Choigum Trungpa Rinpoche founded this school in Europa and then invited Ginsberg to be involved and start the poetry program there. Um, I know that Alan told me that Kerouac had been playing around with Buddhism, experimenting with it, and that he taught Alan stuff well before Alan even knew about um, Buddhism, or Naropa, of course, it wasn't even in existence back then, and that Kerouac was a Buddhist, uh, or thought of himself as that. Um, he was also Catholic, so I don't know. But the point is that, you know, meditation and the ideas of it, and the whole idea of emptying one's mind and um, I mean, Alan had been sort of thinking about those things way before the school started. He went to India looking for a, a Hindu guru, and he'd always been interested in finding a teacher to teach him some, some form of spirituality. Oh, uh, I thought Boulder was uh, not ever going to be a poetry town uh, about 1974, because uh, it hadn't been before, and it seemed to be dominated by visual artists as far as the art went. Uh, and I thought, oh, this is because of the beauty of the surroundings and the light and all that stuff. But then it did pop in here due to the, well, you know all about that, Trungpa Rinpoche. If it wasn't for that meeting, then, uh, you know, say, if it wasn't, for, if there was no Ginsburg involved, then there would have been no Ann Waldman involved, and there wouldn't have been, no, wouldn't have been any William Burroughs involved, and all the people that were involved that were writers or poets or teaching writing or poetry all came through Ginsburg or Aunt Waldman. And a lot of times they wouldn't have come anywhere for that small amount of money or any, they wouldn't have even gone and taught anywhere because they were writers and they weren't teachers. You know, this, this place has always been sort of a home to oddball <laughs> seekers, as it were, or exotic seekers. And uh, uh, all I know is that he had a group going in the early 70s that used to meet up at Sunshine Canyon. and uh, So Ann and Alan just followed him for whatever reason. And so um, the, the fact that Alan started the school and um, brought these amazing people here kind of put the school on the map, I think, number one, so which allowed more and more people to come, you know, just to teach and to be here and to be in Boulder away from New York City or L.A., wherever they're coming from. But also for, for me, it was really interesting watching how Alan kind of um, was this one, sort of one-man 
public relations publicity machine. In the, those first two summers, they expected a few hundred people to come and participate, and uh, uh, two or three thousand showed up each time. So it was clearly sort of a, a moment whose time had arrived in some way, and it hit a little nerve or, or pulse. Everybody tended to drive back and forth coast to coast every year. Bob and I in this VW bug would drive to New York and then we would drive to San Francisco and then we would drive uh, wherever. Uh, everybody did that and it was like having friends all across the country that you could stop with. And then Naropa plopped in and my favorite little metaphor is, do you know in Gulliver's Travels, there's an island called Laputa? And remember that? And uh, it, it floats over countries and then drops down on them to collect taxes and exert its powers and so forth. And it's, it seemed a little bit like that at first. Uh, <laughs> Naropa was made up of these hotshot bicoastal poets, you know, who didn't particularly, uh, th there was a resentment on the part of the locals at, at first, and uh, it seemed like they didn't particularly look around in this little hick western town and uh, see what was here, but they just brought in their own stuff and set about to establish it. Once I was on Naropa's mailing list, I got these catalogs in the mail, and I would read about these workshops like, you know, writing with Peter Olofsky and um, you know, he was, him and his brothers were these unusual characters and on the road. And, uh, you know, looking back on it, I've likened it to like fantasy baseball camp. None of them had ever really taught formally. Alan had never taught before that time. But Alan, uh, but Trungpa Rinpoche felt that it was time for Alan to teach, that he could do that at that point and it would be good. And so he, they all began teaching classes on a very informal scale. Um, in people's houses, apartments, um, sometimes a fraternity or sorority from CU would be rented and they would take place there. Um, and the whole thing began to cook in its way. Now this gets me in the mood to teach. to take for bow boobs or bail boobs? Bail bobs? Bail bobs. Bob. What's a bail bob? Tree. Holy tree. It's a holy tree. <laughs> All right. Okay, I'll start again. Two columns, which was not difficult, far less impossible, to take for bail bobs. Holy tree. Bail bobs. All right, bail bobs. It would just seem uh, unbelievable that you could go to a college where your teachers would be your heroes from books and your favorite writers. And uh, I had basically got into Ginsburg and Corso and all the other beat writers because of my interest in Kerouac and how great his writing was. And uh, at first I read all his books and then I read all the books about him and then I tried to read all his friends' books and tried to find the articles and magazines and newspapers and read all those. And, uh, you know, and um, by the time the first summer that I was here, I, I got to be Allen Ginsberg's uh, teaching assistant, you know, the first summer. And the summer of 86 when I was here, um, they had the classes at this Kappa Sigma house at CU. So the question was, who's sleeping on your floor? Because in the, there were the people who were there because they had been invited to come and do stuff. And then there were like the Fugs or whomever who were driving through and stopped and then would sleep at someone's place, you know. And the whole thing was a lovely broil of like a turnover. Um, now that was when, you know, originally, well, I'm sure you've got all that. Originally, the group 
or those persons who were attracted to Trumpa. Yeah. I would like to know who decided yourself um, to become a is your contemporary influence in your writing on, on me? Okay, well, uh, very strongly Chogyam Trungpa at the moment, pushing me toward improvisation, blues, or toward improvisation, like making up poems right on the spot without relying on a, pen, uh, on a, a piece of paper. Alan Ginsberg really thought uh, Rinpoche was a great teacher, and uh, Alan was very much into Buddhism, and was really a, a, a real practitioner. I remember he would a lot of people say they're Buddhists, but finally what it comes down to is being, you know, taking the time to sit and meditate. And a lot of people never did that who were claimed to be Buddhists, which is what it's about, finally. And I remember he would do that at least an hour a day. He would just stop his day and sit and meditate. I bring him into my teaching in some, uh, for example, I teach, um, I teach uh, psychoanalytic theory as it relates to uh, literary theory. And I find Trungpa's observations uh, parallel uh, Jacques Lacan's observations in many cases. Um, I don't know too much about Rinpoche um, or Troy and Trungpa, but uh, I've heard, you know, a lot of, there's lots of rumors and stuff that people hear about. Um, but I think the most important thing to consider when thinking about him is his whole idea of crazy wisdom. And everything he did was centered around that whether or not he was doing it in excess or not. It kind of rocked the poetry community, and um, yeah, it's that, it's that clash of civilizations. I don't want to use that phrase. It's a, there's the cultural clash involved in what is essentially a monarchical arrangement coming to an ostensibly democratic nation. The guru is the, guru's the king, right? Now, how do you negotiate that? And many, many uh, teachers from the East have had this problem. If, if his word is, if you commit to the teacher, then his, you take his word seriously. But in, uh, for Americans, that's um, an iffy proposition often. When I was screaming at, a couple of years ago, when I was screaming at Trungpa for drinking and smoking too much, he said, like, what you say, uh, uh, I listen to you, I hear you, but anything you propose to me that comes out of anxiety only creates more anxiety, don't you realize? Or just as the closed circle of cause and effect, it never gets out of that closed circle. You don't need the word karma, you just need obvious common sense. Uh, Bombay Gin, I believe, was uh, Troyam Trungpa's uh, favorite drink. And uh, a couple students in the 70s uh, decided to start a literary journal and called it Bombay Gin after that. Marlboro's, uh, Saki, uh, you know, um, he tried to westernize it. The poetry comes from an expression of one's phenomenal world in the written form. It could be either prose or poetry form. <clears throat> it's not so much if, from the Buddhist point of view, it's that uh, you write good poetry particularly, but how you f your thought patterns become uh, elegant that you see a phenomenal world is, uh, has process, stages, as a view. In the Buddhist situation, that uh, everything is a learning situation, so that the teacher can share their sense of journey with the student, and the student can share their sense of journey with the teacher, rather than the professors or teachers have stopped, and they have received their PhD degree, and after that they don't have further learning to do. So the idea is mutual exploration, and uh, obviously the uh, purpose of the whole thing is to develop some sense of sanity. And the whole thing had what I think Trungpa Rinpoche wanted, which was an experiential, is the term that came about, cast to it all. Not just intellectual study and talk, but an experiential level to it, so that you were, people were bringing their own experience in their art, um, and trying to pass that on to others and talk about it in that, on that basis. So these people from all different walks of life had become unwashed hippies, you know, with like overalls and long hair and beards, and a lot of them maybe even inspired by Allen Ginsberg, you know. He had told his followers at one point that um, it was going to be hard enough to be Buddhist 
in America, in Western society in the United States, in addition to being like an unusual person, you know, with unusual and outward appearance, you know. In harmony with the Tao, the sky is clear and spacious, the earth solid and full. All creatures flourish together, endlessly repeating themselves endlessly renewed. When humans interfere with the Tao, the sky becomes filthy, the earth depleted. The equilibrium crumbles, creatures become extinct. Thus the master has compassion for all the parts because she understands the whole. Her constant practice is humility. She doesn't glitter like a jewel, but lets herself be shaped by the Tao as common and rugged as a stone. So just what's your first hit this time? What's, what phrase, what word spoke to you? What, what phrase didn't make sense? What phrase are you more curious about? My first thought <clears throat> is just um, be extraordinary in your ordinariness. Going with the whole idea of just a regular stone versus being, being a jewel. Okay. It's okay to be ordinary. I think we in Europa sometimes feel that we have to be really different and weird and crazy and self-expressive, and that's true, and I think that's good to, to an extent, but it's okay to just wear normal clothes sometimes and not dressed in costume and, um, and different things like that, just being completely okay with normal. Europe has always been this great haven for uh, hippies. <laughs> Even now, it's 2007. Same students. I walk around, I can't believe it. You know, it's like wow. Um, you know, I smell patchouli oil, I think, and, um, and and everyone has long hair, and there's nothing wrong with that. Of course, it's just amazing, because you know, 74 to 2007, that's a number of years. I noticed there's this kind of like. Cool, it's like this cool thing here to be this beat Buddhist poet. <laughs> and I think, I, I mean, that's fine, but um, there is like a new generation, I feel like, of people, at, and especially at Naropa, who are um, looking for that subculture. I think uh, back in the 70s that uh, people were more many of the poetry students were more purely or more preponderantly beat oriented mm -hmm. and uh, there was uh, there was a thing then I mean many of them were quite wonderful but there was also a sort of percentage of them who felt that to be a good poet you had to get drunk a lot and uh, and that's about it and <laughs> in terms of the writing program what we get mostly are students who are there as students and what they really are is beginning writers and so, and they mean to be writers and um, that absolutely alters the diction and vocabulary that occur um, I never get anyone who says is this going to be on the test well I never give tests but you know it's like um, you don't get that mindset. I was interested in the practice element here, and also the I, there was um they sent like a really cheesy brochure, with, like butterflies all over it it's about changing the world. And I remember in my undergrad, I really wanted to go to Oberlin for that reason, and I didn't end up doing it. And so I was like, now's my chance to go to the like hippie school. I heard from the University of Colorado that they wanted me to come there and be guest artist in the writing program. So I came back and at that point Naropa had just been accredited 
And I was going nuts with these UC students who were a very homogenized group. I mean, they were people really who came to Colorado because they were skiers. And um, I love talking about writing with people who love talking about writing. Skiers don't particularly like talking about writing. It's a required class. Teaching people who are in a required class sucks. You don't have this kind of dead zone in the back of the room that often you find at bigger school, bigger state schools, um, of people who are there, you know, just because they chose the class and they have to be there. It's usually a much more engaged population. Not that that's not true everywhere, you know, with the front part of the room, but it's more that front part of the room that you get here, and it keeps you on your toes as a faculty member. I knew nothing about Naropa, um, but I moved into um, a apartment that had been um, lived in by Stephen Taylor, who is a faculty member here, and I, I put my harmonium in this special place in this room at the back, and then I discovered that Allen Ginsberg had been his friend. He had accompanied Allen Ginsberg on his travels, and that was the exact place that Allen Ginsberg had put his harmonium. Hey, Father Death, I'm flying home. Hey, old man, you're all alone. Hey, old daddy, I know. Small town, boulder, downtown, spring. Time to show off your meat. Go home when it's dark and sit down with the bones. I live in a bare bones room. He's working my fingers to the bone. My friend Stephen is living close to the bone. I'm boning up on my Dante, William Carlos Williams, Campion, and Gertrude Stein. And why is he such a bonehead? Won't listen to a thing I say. And why are they so bone idle? Won't do a thing I say. I'm going to point my aborigine bone at you and get you wiser. I've got a bone to pick with a senator. I've got a bone to pick with a pentagon. The bone of contention has to do with whether or not we get a lease. Our old 68 Ford's an old bone shaker. Ivory, dentine, whalebone, dominoes, dice, castanets, corset are some of the things made of bone. But after I die, make of my bones flutes and of my skin drums. I implore you in the name of all female deities, wrathful and compassionate, and protect deer also. The first thing I noticed when I got to Naropa and I went to this open mic night, at the Laughing Goat on Pearl Street. And I noticed um, all these people reading poems like Ann Waldman. And I was thinking, you know, Ann Waldman's been reading and writing that way since, you know, the 60s. And we're in the 2000s now, and we're still doing this. And I think that's the biggest problem I, I see with the whole beat influence on Naropa and Boulder is that people are so in love with it that they don't try to move past it, I guess. There is a uh, reliance on Ginsburg and the Beats, who have become, who have remained in popular culture, uh, heroes and uh, maybe laughable heroes in some ways, but uh, still heroes. Ginsburg especially, and Kerouac, and you know even Corso, who is more of a laughable hero, uh, but but he's recognized as a great talent, which he was, and and so on, and uh, but. So the beats are still in the limelight, happily for Naropa and happily for their memory. But uh, at the same time, that does wear thin a bit, and uh, one needs to go on uh, to newer models and include newer models, and, and Naropa has been doing that. Ann Waldman is the leader of the summer writing program and uh, the big visionary, I think.
Now, Ann Warman's got a way to go. But not too far. She doesn't have too far to go. Does she think, hey, folks, what do you think? Do you think I'm picking on this one? <laughs> think she's a good poet? I yeah, she has good feeling, but she just doesn't know how to use the words. She doesn't know how to use the words. She always says, I do this and continues doing it. You haven't been to a There's no break in her poetry. Uh, Cabo Blue Mouth was great. I mean, it's not profound, her poetry. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I've been, been there, been there, I've been there. It's not profound enough, but it's beautiful. Yeah, great, big deal, beautiful. The history of the school, I actually wasn't aware of until I came to the school, um, and it was very difficult for me to hear many of the controversies about um, Trungpa or even Ginsburg. Um, I haven't really let that get in the way of, of my learning here, but it's definitely something that I think about. Like uh, both Burroughs and Ginsburg had gotten criticisms over the years at Naropa from pe members of the community and students and everything that they actually took to heart and learned lessons in their life. Like they would say, Alan, you know, you can't remember a woman's name if your life depended on it. You know, like you remember all these guys' names and all these kids' names but you meet these important women writers and you can't even remember their names and they're working at the same school. I think he actually called Ann Waldman for a long time, Diane, and she was like one of his best friends, you know, and uh, and co-founders of Naropa because there was also Diane De Prima that was there and he just wasn't paying a lot of attention to women's names, you know. And I mean, you know, Alan wasn't perfect. He had an awful inclination to think that any beautiful young man was probably a genius. You know, and uh, I think he probably therefore misled some beautiful young men into thinking they were geniuses. I assume they managed to survive and locate themselves a different life later on that didn't depend on that. And it probably made them feel good. I think that the beat legacy is a choice and some people choose to find out a lot about it. And a lot of the guys, the male students at this school, are hugely read in the beat movement. And um, it's a male, like I think that's the other thing, is I've been really turned off by the boys I've met at the school at first, like a, in the writing program, mainly like based in arrogance and ego, and a lot of it backed up by the beat poets. So I'm just like, I don't want to touch them. Yeah, I mean, at different times, uh, people would be like, why do you like these famous people? And uh, I would think, boy, do you have it totally wrong. You know, and boy, do you misunderstand me completely, you know, because it's not like you like somebody because they're famous, you know, you, somebody becomes famous because they did some great piece of art or something and you like them because you like their work. I'm a, I think I'm jealous of them. Like, I'm kind of jealous of the fact that they get to say things that I'd like to say, but when they say it, it like shatters grounds. And I don't, like, I might be just an arrogant writer, but I don't see myself and a lot of my peers that different. It's just the time we're in. And I, it annoys me. Like, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not interested in reading what they have to say. When Alan hit the scene with Howell, his influence immediately loomed large. When he traveled, for instance, and he went to Europe, he went all over, he had a backpack, and in that backpack, he had writing by Kerouac, by Burroughs, and by Corso. There were other people as well, I'm sure, but those are the three who were being heard for the first time because Alan, whenever he would give readings in London or wherever, would be reading their work as well. So that uh, he was personally responsible for launching the beats. And yet, one still sees in academic circles an inclination to treat him as some kind of negligible kook. And it just was not the case. The movement in poetry in which he participated, in which he gained his fame, was essentially a kind of renaissance of oral poetry, the spoken word, uh, which began uh, for his generation 
in San Francisco, let's say, with a coffee gallery readings organized by Kenneth Rexroth in the mid 1940s, mid to late 1940s. When Anne and Alan came here and founded this place, uh, 73, 74, it was just a natural thing that you, when you had distinguished guest artists, you would record what they were doing. As a result, we now have about, we think about 6,000 hours of audio. It grows at about a rate of a couple hundred hours per year. It's one of them, it's been recognized by the National Endowment for the Arts and the NEH and the Grammy Foundation as one of the most important literary audio archives of the post-war uh, years because every, all of the lineage, the Black Mountain poets, the Black Arts people, the New Yorkans, the Black Mountain, the... Place so hip, even the rats doing the hustle. Despite its beauty, this world is ugly. The ugliest ugly is the social ugly, the horrible is horrible, the terrible is terrible, simple shit, uh, simple shit, uh, simple shit, uh, simple, 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 simple shit. Society's ugly is the grasping class, it's simple shit, uh, see impul, see impul, see impul, some see impul shit. Ain't nothing legitimizes this motherfucking upside down bullshit system, see impul. <coughs> Nothing. What I was really talking about was what I felt as a loss in having Allen die, Burroughs die, Corso die, all of those persons who came during the first decade of the program. That was uh, incredibly vital and having those persons not be here is bound to have an influence on the program. At the same time, the people who are here continue to have much the same values. So the values have pertained, but we've lost Alan. I mean, how could you not notice that you've lost Alan? You know, that was huge. Subject or person seems to be experienced as a value by itself. Those affections which are most intimate to us, you might say, seem to be what a criteria of value. Now, most of the time we're intimidated and those affections which are most intimate to us are not necessarily seen as being important. In fact, very often we wind up putting ourselves down and saying, we're nothing but shit anyway, so we might as well follow the leader. I just so. want to say, when we founded the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics, uh, the point of using Create This Poetics School and Department was the notion that Kerouac had experienced the first Buddhist noble truth of suffering. Mm. Cool. So you can suffer. <laughs> you can suffer. Let it I'm, all hang out. I'm we'll name a school after. I'm just trying to remember I'm in this room right now. So. Um, not really a room, I guess. In other, um, in every other class, there's a contemplative component, meaning you can see all the cushions and so on in the corner of the room, meditation cushions. Um, but the Jack Kerouac school has no. Um, there's nothing around bowing in to the classes, and uh, you don't have to be a Buddhist, you know, to be on the faculty. Most of the faculty are, you know, not Buddhists. It's all about writing. When I first came here, all BA students were required to sit. And I immediately said I thought Buddhism was not a proselytizing religion. And I felt this was inappropriate. Plus, they gave one of my best writers an F in Buddhist studies and I said, what is this, a joke? You know, and it was like, well, he doesn't do the work. I said, he doesn't do the work because he's not a Buddhist and he doesn't want to be one. So how does that work out in the general scheme of things? And can you, in fact, afford to turn down people who come here for specific reasons that are not Buddhism? Um, it was very hard for me at first because things that I was practicing outside of school now were being studied full-time in school. So there's all these criteria that have to be met. That was the hardest part for me was just 
is the hardest part for me is the institutionalized aspect of it. But there's something to be said about the people here that not only want to change the world, but also are willing to go inside and fix themselves before throwing, throwing up basically everywhere, everything that's wrong with them. And I, really, I do believe that in activism, that's, there's, two, there's two issues. There's the issue of like avoiding activism for the rest of your life because you want to save your own soul, which is the problem in this community probably too. But then there's the issue of like just so many of my friends who are messed up inside. And they acted out through saving the world. And I just don't think it's, it's not going to work. <laughs> Do you really think that, I mean, I, I think that this country and all power structures uh, like it can absorb, um, I don't know, I think they can absorb millions of sitting Buddhists and continue with the same activities and be not conscious of them one way or the other, or be conscious of it, and it will have little effect on genocide. Well, I, I'm not sure that all the radical activity of the last 15 years has done much good, actually. It may have only confused matters worse. Uh, and things may have just worked along the way they worked anyway. Anywho. Picture an hourglass and a hammer. Can a moment hum coming together? Yes. Squeezing through the birth canal one plus one. But a body of water is scatterbrained. Listen to the traffic hum. It's natural for me to try to impress you with my kindness. So, and that's incomplete. And the whole thing's incomplete, but that's what I'm working on. <laughs> Bloody hell. How do I teach creativity? Um, the first thing that comes to mind is that um, I have a commitment that when I come onto this campus, I am a writer and I'll leave with my writing self, my person as a writer in the world, intact. I think my attitude, and I think the attitude we try to instill, is that you're already a writer. It's not that you're studying to be a writer. You already are part of art, of literary history. One of Ginsburg's, um, when I first met Ginsburg, he said to me, um, you have to make a record of what you're doing. You have to, you have to, you have to, um, you have to write your own history. Nobody's going to do it for you. The idea being that you are already part of the lineage. It's not like, you know, you meet the lineage. You're in it already. Not everyone has a PhD, but the thing is, you're meant to really be a working writer. So I try to, um, I try to hold that up in my own life. We try to uh, instill in the students the notion that this is it. Here you are. You already have a career. This is it. Here are, here are the ancestors, you know? You know, Naropa is always dependent on, on its teachers being practicing writers. So maybe giving up a certain sheen of, of pedagogical professionalism uh, for the live wire verve that might come through the fact that the teacher is struggling to be a writer. And, that's the thing about being a writer is that you struggle constantly. It's curious that in the academic structure, you can have a person go through college and get a degree, and it's the degree that justifies their teaching, painting or writing or whatever. But that's very different than taking the persons who do the teaching from the world mind of persons who are within the discipline. I look at my students sometimes and I, um, especially students whose writing does not transform, students who um, don't respond to anything from the outside, architecture from the outside, Elizabeth Grish, um, and they seem to be here more for a social reason to create a collective which can be valuable but sometimes I take students aside and say you could save your money, meet your friends in the cafe and keep on writing in your notebook. Students whose work remains inviolate to perceptions from any other direction. And so I think a lot of people thought and still think that they can come and instead of getting taught 
they're going to come and show the teachers their poems and they're going to be like, wow, these are great. Do you want to meet my agent? You know, and then they're going to become, they're going to get discovered, you know, the way that people thought of, you know, Lana Turner getting discovered at a soda fountain in Hollywood or something. You know, you, for myself, it was like, uh, I felt a little guilty about teaching writing because I have this feeling that uh, no one should be encouraged to be an artist. Uh, it's, uh, I know Creeley said, artists are expected to live where dogs would die. <laughs> and that feels more or less like it. It's like an artist, uh, if an artist is having a hard time, well, hey, you know, what did that person think was going to happen to them? It's like uh, their choice is art instead of money. And uh, so, I mean, I think we do a good job of turning out people who are capable of accepting penury. It doesn't, for me, I notice it doesn't necessarily prepare you. I've noticed that a lot of graduates um, don't necessarily know what they're going to do for, to make money. It doesn't really prepare you for that a whole lot. I think you'd have to go outside of Naropa to find um, guidance on that. But it's definitely in time for, it's, it gives the opportunity to get credit for a lot of self-healing. Because we had a big teacher's meeting uh, yesterday uh, about money, to consider money, because the whole scene is going to fold uh, unless we do make, uh, make enough money to keep it going. And what apparently is required by next Thursday is $23,000 by Thursday, next Thursday night, which breaks down in the school to $70 a student, which, in other words, uh, the, the, uh, what we did, the teachers decided to go out into all the classes and ask the students to see if they can uh, magically invent $70 by Thursday. That is one way or another, like uh, for your parents, or go out and pedal your ass, or whatever. <laughs> or get it out of the bank, or borrow it from uh, your neighbor. <clears throat> uh, that, what that will do is actually get the uh, school through um, to the end of the term. Like, uh, I'm having to work free, and a lot of the other faculty are, are doing what they're doing free. So for me, it's, uh, I'm having to give money to support this. Like last term, I gave 500 bucks and, and cut out my salary. So I'm actually doing this for the pleasure of doing it, as presumably the students are here and not being an accredited school for the pleasure of being here. Um, they are not making the payment to their teacher. Um, in fact, quite the opposite, you know. Uh, Naropa very famously, um, you know, I, I could be paid more if I taught in a community college. So a lot of teachers here are here for the gift of their own freedom in the classroom, but um, you know, they can, they can create different models. I mean, this, you know, any, like any school, there's bureaucracy. And Naropa, for a school as small as it is, it seems to have had a lot of bureaucratic wrangles over the years with who's president and who's, who's in charge of what and um, people never getting paid enough and it's the usual stuff. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's Buddhist or state school or a private college. I mean, I think it's, it's all the same. Finally, it's a university and it has bureaucracies and personality clashes and, and I don't think Buddhism in any way um, mellows that out, you know. I, I do think Naropa is very special in, in that it's, uh, it does seek to be, as Anne says, an outrider place or an outsider place or, or it seeks to, uh, to keep up, it seeks, it seeks to break up establishment values. And of course, it becomes its own establishment constantly, as everything does. But it, it seeks pretty well to break up those values <laughs> most of the time. There's no such thing as institutionalized creativity. And so you have to fight it constantly and find your own form of creative voice. And in a lot of ways, if you are in a truly authentic creative program that is trying to institutionalize what you're doing, then you will bust out of it, break it open, and be a better writer as a result. Because the point of writing is to not be confined. 
And the point of writing is to get rid of those voices that tell you what to do. And the whole point is to be truly honest. And if it's being institutionalized, and you, it just gives you a bigger, it's like, it's like you'll run faster when something's chasing you. So what is the Tao? What the heck are we talking about? We haven't even talked about what the Tao is. What is the Tao? Maybe some of you know the literal translation of it. The way. The way. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very simple. It's the way. So you have to talk about the way things are. It's just the way. You may equate it to the path also. But it's also the way things are. It's the way of the world. So if you open yourself to the way, you can embody it completely. And we all want to embody it completely, don't we? We want to be fully here. My own notion is that at every moment, there should be the newest moment point of departure. And that what you do each time is you say, so this is how it is now, and then you move. So this is how it is now, and you move. You can do that here. When I was driving across the desert from California to actually come here and teach, one of the things I was thinking was, what if I am bored? What if it is boring? So within that, I thought, well, if I'm bored, I leave, you know, and I'm still here. Disembodied Poetics, I will now read from my book Incubation, A Space for Monsters in my normal speaking voice, which is a British accent. Right, L. L is for Lalu, darkness in a dress. Her body is very vulnerable tonight, there in the forest next to the highway. Only children on road trips notice her and wave. In her red dress, she is like a girl in a fairy tale, geographically. All the branches behind her have begun to stir. This is what a girl does in stories. She walks slowly, almost meditatively, along the perimeter of a forest and then she veers. Are there forests in London? Yes. Are there forests in the ocean? Yes. Are there forests in New Jersey and Nebraska? Yes. She finds each forest in turn and enters it as a test of desire. Sorry. It'll live. Did somebody No, I don't think so. Oh, okay. <laughs> Would you mind if I got a shot of you right there, though? Pardon? Do you mind if I just take a picture of you right there? Oh, no, not at all. No, you, you're perfect right there, sir. Okay. And you can go in the house if you want to. You can go on in the house, too. Okay. I'm just going to follow you in with the camera. Oh, okay. All right. Excellent. Let's start all over. All right. <laughs> Suddenly the <laughs> whole thing has gone, gone afloat. Actually, why don't you ask me when I first came to Naropa? Because I came with Bob in 74 when it first began. Okay. And that would be more interesting in terms of your documentary than me describing my background, I think. Yeah, I just meant like briefly like, I mean, who, who, 
Oh, we'll honey, do I don't here. do brief. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He had on one of these panels in that room that that Burroughs and Ginsburg and Robert Creeley were on, where all these people were on this panel and they asked them to say something that they felt was on their mind. And Creeley had said that he recommended that all poets floss because um, if you're going to be a poet, you're unlikely to make enough money to afford a good dentist. So um, if you floss, then maybe you could uh, get away. You know, you wouldn't have to be there wouldn't have to be that day where you couldn't afford to have your rotten teeth fixed or whatever. And people were talking a lot about hygiene and stuff like this on this panel, which I couldn't understand how it got into that. Let's see. Well, my glasses for this. To be realistic, I can't see a thing. Oh, let's see. What do I do with this? You're not taking the sound, are you? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Okay. My, my. Maybe I should cut and paste this or throw it away altogether because it's an utter pile of shit, right? I love shit. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Oh, maybe put an X right there. Yeah. Okay. 